Drawing multi-line text on HTML canvas can be a challenge. In this class, we will go from drawing a simple single letter to a dynamic block of text that automatically centers itself vertically and horizontally. We will learn about all available HTML canvas tools that allow us to draw and style text, we will apply gradients and we will turn the entire thing into a dynamic particle system that recreates text as we type it into an input field. It will also have physics and it will react to mouse movement. Let's deep dive into creative coding from basics to advanced in a single class. And as usual, all of this using just plain vanilla JavaScript. No frameworks and no libraries. Let's go! was initially introduced by Apple back in 2004 to power their dashboard widgets. Canvas is a perfect tool to display graphs, animations, games and image compositions. HTML Canvas was not originally made to display text and you can tell because compared to CSS its text related toolkit is limited. To draw text on Canvas that breaks to another line we have to write that logic ourselves. Canvas fill text method will not do that automatically. I recommend using standard text that can be styled with CSS wherever possible, but sometimes, like for the effect we are building today, we need to draw it on canvas. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to convert that text into beautiful animated particle system with physics and mouse interactions. Complex interactive animations like this are the real purpose of HTML canvas and it is perfect for that. HTML canvas offers two methods to draw text, fill text and stroke text. We pass them text we want to draw and x and y coordinates where to draw it. The fourth optional argument is maximum width to draw. We can also use font property to define size and font family. I will explain exactly how text alignment and baseline works on canvas. We will try some experimental properties such as letter spacing and we will learn how and when to use built-in canvas measure text method. In this case it will help us to determine when the line of text is too wide, too long and at that point we break text to another line. The second part of this class will be advanced, so if this is your first canvas project, maybe you should try my beginner playlist first. Let's discover HTML canvas and learn how to draw multi-line centered text and in the advanced section we will break that text into interactive animated particles straight from the input field as the user types in it. Have fun! So here I'm styling my input element with CSS. Notice that the width is 100% and if I give it padding 10 pixels we get horizontal scroll bars. Padding made the element too wide. I can fix that up here and give all elements box size in border box which means that padding and border will be included in elements total width and height. Look how it fixes the sizing issue, no more scroll bars. I also want some space around the element so I give it margin 10 pixels. As you can see we have horizontal scroll bar again because box sizing only affects padding but not margin. This is important to remember if you want to be a master of CSS. <laughs> we can fix that using a completely different tool modern CSS offers. The calc function lets us perform calculations when specifying CSS property values. I want input field to be 100% of the browser window without that 10 pixel margin and since it's from both sides we have to do 20 pixels. We wrap that in calc function like this and that's all. Easy. I want animations to play as user types in this field, so I will make sure this field is always on top and interactable by giving it a z-index of 100. In script.js I wrap everything in load event listener. When canvas element and all other elements on our web page have loaded, we will set up our project custom canvas variable and we will point it towards canvas element with get element by id. ctx context where I take that canvas variable and I call get context on it. Passing it 2D to initialize a set of built-in 2D drawing methods we can now call from this ctx variable. Canvas element has two independent sizes that need to be synchronized, otherwise we get distorted shapes. When you set canvas size with just CSS, you are setting just the element size. But doing that will stretch the drawing surface size and it will distort your drawings. The right way to set canvas size is using canvas width like this. 
it will set both element size and drawing surface size to the same value. I want the canvas to cover the entire browser window horizontally and also vertically. The text I want to draw is for example hello, like this. Let's console log CTX from line 3 that contains all canvas properties and drawing methods. Get context creates an instance of this built-in canvas rendering context 2D API and here we can see all different canvas settings. For example, we can see that font on canvas is by default set to 10 pixels sans serif and text line is set to start. I will show you what exactly start means in a second. Down here we can also see built-in drawing methods, for example fill text is here. All these properties and methods sit on this CTX variable and we can call the methods and update these properties from there. To call this fill text method, I take CTX from line 3 dot fill text. Built-in fill text method expects at least three arguments, text we want to draw and x and y coordinates where to draw it. On canvas, when we draw images and rectangles, these x and y coordinates always determine the top left corner from where we start drawing that shape, but with text it's different. With text, these x and y coordinates determine axis of the text and we can control where the text sits in relation to that axis by using text align and text baseline canvas properties. I'm trying to draw the text from coordinates 50, 80. The reason I see nothing is because my canvas has a black background and if we have a look here, we can see that the default fill style on canvas is also black. We are drawing black text. I can access this fill style property and I have to do it before I call fill text because the file gets read and executed from top to bottom. I access this canvas setting, so called canvas state and I set fill style to white. Perfect. We are drawing text. I can also use canvas font property and I set it to 150 pixels Helvetica. Like this. 80 pixels. I will draw my text at coordinates 100 from the left edge and 150 pixels from the top edge of canvas like this. The second built-in method that allows us to draw text on canvas is stroke text. It works exactly the same as fill text, but instead of filled text shape, it will give us text outlines. If I want to highlight my existing text, I need to pass it exactly the same values I passed to fill text. We can't see anything because the default stroke style is black. Stroke style determines the color of lines and outlines on canvas. I access it from CTX variable, as usual, and I override the default value by setting it to orange red. I will replace the text we are drawing here and here with this text variable from line 7. That way I can change the filled text and stroke text at the same time by changing this one variable. I can also give stroke text uh, different coordinates if I want. The outline is very thin, by default line width is set to 1 pixel. Again we can override that value, I can try 10 pixels, that's too thick. How about 3 pixels? I will put x and y coordinates of the text into variables. And I use these new variables here and here. Letter spacing property specifies the spacing between letters. As of making this video, it is still marked as experimental, so it might not work in some browsers. I'm just showing you what's possible. Let's delete it. Green fill style, blue stroke style, yellow and white. I can move text around. I want the axis that determines horizontal position of the text to be exactly in the middle of canvas, so canvas width from line 4 divided by 2. The other axis that determines vertical position will be canvas height divided by 2. So you can see that I set my text to be exactly in the middle of canvas and this is what we get. I want you to fully understand what's going on, it's actually simple. Let's draw that axis to make it absolutely clear what is happening. I want to draw a line in the middle of canvas at the same position as the axis along which our text aligns. I start by calling begin path to tell JavaScript I want to draw a new shape. Move to built in method sits right here and it will determine starting x and y coordinates of the line. Let's say 100 pixels horizontally from the left edge and 100 pixels vertically from the top edge. 
Line2 built-in method will in this case determine the ending coordinates of our line. I want the line to end at coordinates 200, 300. I stroke the line. Stroke method is coming from here. We set stroke style to white down here, but up here it's still set to default black color, so I don't see anything. Let's set stroke style to red. Move2 method sets the starting coordinates of the line. Line2 method determines where the line ends in this case. You can also call line2 multiple times to draw shape made out of multiple lines. You can play with the values you pass to it as arguments to make it clear. I take line width declaration from down here and I move it up here so that it applies to everything. I want the line to start from the middle of canvas horizontally. Like this. And I want it to end in the middle of canvas at the bottom. So like this. Now we can actually see that axis along which our text aligns by default. Because we draw that text in the middle of canvas horizontally here on line 15. We can change where the text sits in relation to this axis using built-in canvas text align property. By default, this property is set to start. We can see that here. We can also set it to end. Look how that works when I make the word longer. I hope this makes it clear. End will make sure the right edge of the text touches the axis we define when drawing the text. In this case, we decided to put that axis in the middle of canvas, but of course we can put it anywhere we want by passing fill text or stroke text methods different values here. So values passed here determine the position of this axis. Text align property determines where the text sits horizontally in relation to that axis. I think it would make more sense if the default value was center, but we can always change that manually here like this. We can also use start or left, which will give us the same result. And if we use end or right, we will get text alignment like this. I copy this code block and I will draw another line. Let's make it green. And I want it to go from the middle here and all the way to the right. So like this, exactly in the middle of canvas. As you can see, by default, the text is sitting directly on that line. It can probably depend on font, as some custom fonts can have different bounding box. But by default, we can see font is sitting exactly on that line, in the middle, because we passed it canvas height divided by 2 as vertical position. We defined vertical axis, and by default, baseline of the font in relation to that axis will be this. Keep in mind that letters that have tail like Y or G would reach below this line. I set text align to center here. We can see that default vertical font alignment, text baseline, is alphabetical. So typical way the text is written, letters sitting on the line and tails of letters like lowercase g reaching below that line. Letters like lowercase y and g are called descenders. I can override that default value and I can say top which will make the top of the text touch the axis like this. So again, these values determine the axis and text baseline property dictates where the text will be positioned in relation to that axis. Middle positions the text exactly in the middle vertically like this. If I set text baseline to bottom, it will position it like this, which might seem a bit weird, but look what happens when I use lowercase y, a descender. Bottom positions the text in a way that bottom of descenders touches the axis. Look at the difference between this and alphabetical. I think this makes it clear. Hanging is the same as top and ideographic is the same as bottom. So we have two methods to draw text on canvas, fill text and stroke text. Both of them work exactly the same. One gives us filled text, one gives us just the outline. It's very important to understand that the coordinates we pass to these methods determine position of invisible vertical and horizontal axis along which the text will be aligned depending on the value of text align for horizontal position and text baseline for vertical position. As we said before, HTML Canvas was made to handle graphics, animations and games on the web, and it's so good at it. 
Canvas is not very good at rendering text and it has a very limited toolkit to handle text because it wasn't originally designed to do that. Luckily for us, it works really well in combination with CSS and in most cases I would recommend using CSS to handle text on the web if your project allows it. In some cases you actually need to draw text on Canvas, like for the project we are building today. There is no other way to achieve the effect we are working on today other than draw that text on Canvas and that's why it's good to know the basics we just covered today. We can set max width as optional fourth argument of fill text and stroke text, but at the moment when I'm recording this video, there is no built-in way to make canvas automatically break text on a new line when it gets too long. Let me show you an easy way to do it manually with JavaScript. There are libraries that help with Canvas text massively, but here on this channel we do everything from scratch with vanilla JavaScript because we want to understand how things work under the hood. I go down here and I create a custom function I call for example wrap text. It will expect text we want to draw as an argument. It will measure the width of the text and it will split it into individual lines if needed, before it draws it. We will need some helper variables. Lines array will hold a separate string for each line of text. Line counter will increase every time we need to break to a new line. Line will be a helper variable that accumulates words one by one. If it's long enough, it will place that sentence into lines array and it will reset its content so that it can accumulate and measure words on the next line. I'm going to make a choice that I only want to break to a new line when there is a space, when one word ends and another begins, because splitting words by syllables manually with code can become complicated. I will never split a word in half, I will only break the line when there is a space between two words. So I need a temporary variable I call for example words, which will take the text passed as an argument, however long that text might be, and it will split it into individual strings whenever there is a space character. So I'm taking a string of text, I'm using this argument we call a pattern as a character to look for, in our case a space character, and whenever space occurs in this long text, we split the string into individual substrings, individual words. Split method returns an array of individual words. Basically we simply take this text and we split it into words and we save that in an array. I create a for loop that will cycle over the words array one by one. Like this. Every time we enter this for loop, we create a temporary variable that will take the current value of line from line 36, which will start as an empty string at first. It will add on that word we are cycling over right now and it will add space behind it. We want to measure the width of each word, so I will console.log ctx.measureText and I pass it test line. We will look at measure text in a second. After that, I will fill text and I want to draw test line, so each word one by one and all of them at the same coordinates in the middle of canvas. So at first, all the words will be drawn on top of one another. I need to delete fill text and stroke text here first. I will also delete this text and x and y positions we used there. We don't need this anymore. I take this console log and I put it here. Okay, so we want to call wrap text method. I can see it expects one argument, a text we want to draw. That text can be one letter, one word or a whole sentence. I start by drawing just simple AAA like this. Nothing happens, so first we always check browser console. I can see we have a problem on line 36. The console error says that test line variable from line 36 is not defined. And it's because I am defining test line here inside this for loop as a let variable. It only exists in the scope of this for loop between this opening and this closing bracket, so I fix it by putting it in here. Perfect, we are drawing AAA. Here we are using built-in measure text method and we are passing it test line, which is just this AAA text at the moment. Built-in measure text method returns text matrix object. Uh, I can see it here in the console. It gives us a lot of data. All we really care about today is this width property, so I can console log it like this. Dot width. I can see that this text is around 155 pixels wide. If I type BBB, that second word is exactly the same width. 
interesting. CCC is around 142 pixels wide. You can see that it's drawing words on top of each other. This is expected as we are splitting this text into individual words and we are drawing each word at the same coordinates. In the console I can see measurement for hello including the comma, how, are, you. So far everything works really well. If I want to draw each word on a separate line, that is also easy. I just need to make vertical position of the text dynamic. It will account for index variable from the for loop and multiply it times font size, so 80 pixels. Nice. I can reduce the line height here if I want. We are drawing one word per line. I don't really want that. I want to be drawing text until we reach certain width and only then I want to break to another line. I create a constant variable called max text width. Let's say I want text to be maximum half of the width of canvas like this. This is the bit of logic that can be a bit hard for beginners, but don't worry, it's not that difficult. Let's write it and at the end I will recap the logic loop we have here for clarity. Inside the for loop, as we cycle through words one by one, I say if the width of the test line, I delete this, if it is more than max text width, line from line 32 will be that word plus space. Also, we are going to increase line counter by one. Else, meaning test line is not long enough yet, we set line to test line, increasing line by this new word we are cycling over right now. Then I take lines array from line 30 and I access its index and I set it to line. To specify which index we want to save it as, I will use line counter, which will increase only when we break to a new line. I comment this out and when I save my changes I get an error. It's just because I misspelled this. Now I can take lines array and I call for each built-in array method. For each line element in lines array I take ctx and I call fill text. I delete this line. I copied this line from inside the for loop where we used this for loop index to calculate position of each line. Here, inside for each method we don't have access to that i variable, but for each method auto generates indexes for us as well. We just need to give it a variable name. I will call it index and we use it here. And of course test line is not available from here. We will draw element from lines array as text here. If I console log lines array, you can see that each element in the array is a string of text. We set max text width to a small value, so we still have only one word per line. But if I increase it here on line 27, you can see we are only breaking text to a new line when the text gets too long. Sometimes there will be multiple words. I will now explain the logic of this code block step by step in detail for complete beginners. If you already understand how this logic works, feel free to skip to the next lesson. So the logic is we call wrap text method and we pass it a line of text. In this case, hello, how are you? We create some helper variables. Helper variable I call words will be an array where each element is a single word. In this case, we have array with four words, hello, how, are and you. We create a for loop that will cycle through that array. It will measure the first word and it will add words one by one, only break into the next line when the accumulated sentence is more than max text width from line 27. At first, line is an empty string and we are cycling over words index zero, so hello comma. Test line is empty string from line plus words index zero and we add space. We call measure text and we measure the width of the test line. We compare it to max text width. It's not yet longer, so else statement runs and we set this line variable to test line. So now is hello, comma, space. We take lines array from line 30 and because line counter is still at zero, we set its element with an index of zero to the value of line. For loop runs again, 
This time it cycles over words array index 1, so the word how. Test line takes line, which currently contains hello, comma, space, and it adds how and space behind it. We measure the width of that sentence. Still, it's not wide enough, so we enter else statement and we set line from line 32 to test line. Now, line contains string hello, comma, space, how space. We take lines array from line 30 and since line counter still hasn't increased, we override index 0 with that new longer line. For loop runs again, this time over the word R. Test line takes line and adds this new word and space. So right now line is hello, comma, space, how space, R space. We measure that string of text and this time it is longer than max text width, so we enter this if statement. Inside we disregard all the other previous words because those will be on the previous line and we only assign line, our helpful variable, to this new word which is R and we add space behind it. Also we increase line counter by 1. We take lines array and since line counter increased to 1, we are adding a new element, a second line, which is just the word R. The for loop will run one more time and it will add U to the same line without line counter increasing, which will override element with an index of 1 to R U. We end up with lines array that contains two elements, hello how will be drawn first and R U will be drawn below. If I make the input text longer, you can see that it correctly breaks lines, but ideally we also want the entire text to move upwards so that it's centered vertically. I create a variable that will calculate the height of the entire multi-line text block. I will call it text height. Up here I create a variable I call for example line height. I set it to 80 pixels because we are using font 80 pixels Helvetica here on line 23. Height of the entire text block will be line height times line counter, which simply means height of one line times the number of lines. Vertical position of text, I call it text y. We will pass it here. It will be canvas height divided by 2. The middle of canvas vertically minus half of the height of the entire text block. I place text y here and this is from where the text will start to be vertically aligned. I also want each line of text on a separate row as before, so I add index times line height, as index increases for each line of text. They are placed under each other. There are many tweaks and improvements that can be done here, but this is how you can do multi-line centered text on HTML canvas. Rather than passing the text as an argument here on line 53, I want the text to be coming directly from this input field we have up here, and I want it to update dynamically as we type. I go up here where I declare my variables and I will call it text input spelled like this. Document.getElementById, I give it id of text input, so I use it here. I comment out line 54. I take text input we just created and I add event listener for key up event. In the callback function we take the auto-generated event object and assign it e as a variable name. I will console log e. I click on canvas and press some keys to trigger the event. In the console we can see the keyboard event object. It contains a lot of information. What we care about today is this target property and inside we look for value here. You can see it contains AAA which is the value we typed into the input field. I console log e.target.value and as I type we are console logging these values. I copy this line and I put it inside event listener. Instead of this hard-coded text, I will use dynamic e.target.value, like this. I delete the console log and also this line. 
Nice, it works. It looks like this because we see old paint. We need to delete all canvas drawings every time we update the text. I call clear rectangle from 0, 0 to canvas width canvas height directly from event listener here because I only want to clear canvas when the text changes. Nice, we have a multi-line dynamic text drawn directly on HTML canvas element. Up here on line 22 we are set in fill style of our text to yellow. We can also have gradient fill which will look really good when we break the text into particles a bit later. I create a constant variable I call for example gradient. I set it equal to ctx from line 4 and from there I call built-in create linear gradient method. This method expects four arguments x and y of the start point of the line and x and y of the end point for the line. Imaginary line will be drawn between these two sets of coordinates and gradient will be drawn along this line. So I want gradient to start from the top left corner, coordinate 0, 0 and I want it to go towards the end at the bottom right corner, coordinates canvas width, canvas height. We created a gradient and we set its direction. Now we need to assign it colors. I do it by taking this new gradient variable we just created and I call built-in add color stop method. This method adds a new color stop to a given canvas gradient. It expects two arguments, offset and color. Offset can be any number between 0 and 1. The color passed as the second argument will be position at that offset. Gradient starts from 0 but I will use first offset of 0.3 to push it closer towards the middle of canvas because the text will be more towards the middle. So anything between the beginning and 30% of the gradient will be red color. The second color stop will be exactly in the middle at 0.5 offset and the third will be at 0.7. I will use maybe orange and yellow. To actually apply this gradient to text or shapes we draw on canvas, I take this variable from line 22 and I set it as fill style. Now as I type new text, the gradient is applied. Perfect. You can change any color you want and you can add more color stops. For now I will use red, fuchsia and purple. If you want to experiment, there is also create radial gradient method. You can use it here instead. We covered the basics of HTML canvas text and we added many new tools and techniques into our front-end web developer coding toolkit. This concludes the beginner part of the course. In this next part we will go a bit more advanced. I will convert everything into object-oriented JavaScript and we will turn this dynamic text into particles that react to the mouse and move around with physics such as friction and easing. If you are a beginner, you should maybe watch my Pixels and Physics Canvas Crash course first where I use the same techniques on images and I explain it there slowly, step by step, in a beginner-friendly pace. I comment out all this code except for the closing brackets of load event listener. All we have here is the basic canvas setup. I want to convert all this code into objects and classes. We will have a class called particle. This will be a blueprint for individual particle objects, individual animated pixels that, when combined, will make up the shapes of letters as we type them on canvas. They will have draw and update methods. Effect will be the main core of this code base. It will have a constructor. It will have a wrap text method that will take a long line of text as an argument. As we type it into the input field, it will turn it into multi-line centered text and it will draw it on canvas. We will have convert to particles method that will scan canvas for pixel data and it will use our custom particle class from line 9 to turn those text pixels into interactive animated particle objects. Render method will draw and update all of those particles. Render needs to be called over and over to actually get animation so I will create a custom function I call animate. Up here we have some global variables that will be needed inside our objects. Rather than pulling those directly from the outside, I will pass them as arguments at the point when we create the effect class. So context, canvas width and canvas height are expected as arguments. And inside we convert them into class properties like this. 
I usually just pass context as an argument to draw method, but in this case we will need a reference to context inside wrap text, convert to particles, and also in render method, so I might as well make it into a class property this time. Inside our custom wrap text method that expects text from the input field as an argument, we take this.context from line 23, which we will point towards ctx from line 4 in a second, and we call built-in fill text method. We know that fill text expects text to draw and x and y for the axis in relation to which the text will be positioned. Horizontal position of that axis, text x, will be exactly in the middle of the page, so canvas width divided by 2. Same for the vertical y axis, middle vertically. And I use these values inside fill text here. On line 41 I create a custom variable I call for example effect, and I set it to new effect. The new keyword will create an instance of effect class by triggering its constructor. I can see that the constructor expects three arguments, so I pass it ctx from line 4, canvas width from line 5, and canvas height from line 6, like this. If I console lock effect, I can see that it was created and it has values in all properties. If you see undefined or none, not a number, in some of these values, you need to check the place where that value is calculated in your code and you need to fix that issue. I don't see any undefined, so all is good here. I take effect variable and I call my wrap text method, we defined on line 30. It expects text as an argument, so I pass it hello. It should run fill text method to draw that text, but we can see nothing. I'm console logging ctx so I can see my canvas context object and inside I can see that the default fill style is black. I will declare some canvas settings, state changes in this area. Fill style will be red. Actually I will go down here and I will cut this code. I replace this fill style declaration with this code I just copied. From inside effect class I refer to ctx as this.context to keep our classes modular. I don't want to be pulling outside variables directly into my classes. So again, I create a gradient from coordinate 0, 0 to canvas width, canvas height, using variables from lines 24 and 25. Then I'm taking that gradient and I'm adding three color stops and setting fill style to this new gradient I just created. Font will be 50 pixels Helvetica. I could also declare font size as a separate property, because we might want to declare line height from this value a bit later. And down here I take this.fontSize and I concatenate my font string, like this. Perfect! As we explained before, text align is by default set to start, which gives us this horizontal alignment, and text baseline is by default set to alphabetic. I go down here and I cut this code I wrote before. I paste it up here. CTX needs to be this.context and set in text align to center and text baseline to middle will reposition the text in relation to those invisible axes we spoke about before. Let's see what else we did before. I can delete this line, we already did that. I can delete this code that was drawing the axis for us. I will need line width and stroke style, so I take this. I paste it up here, this.context on both again. Now I can also stroke text, so let's do it. Bigger font size. I take max text width and line height, and those will be class properties on my main effect class. So I replace const with this dot, and I use this.canvas width here. Let's move line height up here, this dot, and it will be relative to font size. This way when I change font size, line height will automatically change as well. I will also need this logic that breaks text into individual lines, if it's too long. I will do it here. 
temporary helper variable called lines array will hold one string for each line of text. Words will take text passed as an argument on line 32 and it will split it wherever there is a space character. Individual words will be held in this array. Line counter will start at zero. Line will start as an empty string. For loop to cycle through words array one by one. Each time it checks a new word, it will add that word to all previous words on that line. Held in line variable from line 50. It will add that new word we are checking and it will add space behind it. Then we will measure the width of all that text as the for loop runs and we are adding one word after another. As soon as the width of the text we are checking is longer than max text width from line 30, we take line at that point instead of accumulating all words one by one, we reset line to contain only this new word that doesn't fit on the previous line anymore plus space character. We also increase line counter by one. Else, meaning text line is not yet longer than max text width, we can keep accumulating words inside line variable until they are long enough. No matter which one of these statements runs, we always take lines array. As index, we pass it line counter to determine which element, which line of text we are overriding, and we set element in the array at that position to line. As long as text is not too wide, we are adding word by word to line, and we keep overriding position zero in lines array with that ever-growing line of text. As soon as that line of text is longer, we delete all previous words except for that one word that doesn't fit on the line anymore, we increase line counter by one and we save that line as new index in lines array. Now we took individual words and we calculated how many words can fit on each line. We are holding those lines inside lines array. We know how many lines of text we will have because of line counter variable, so I know how tall this entire multi-line text block will be. It will be line height times number of lines. Line counter. Because I want the text to be centered vertically, I can now calculate from which vertical position I need to start drawing the first line of my multi-line text block. This dot text y, originally defined on line 27, will be canvas height divided by 2 minus half of the height of the text block, like this. Now I can take lines array, I will use for each array method on it. I call each element in the array L and we will also need this auto-generated index that for each method gives us. I cut these two lines of code and I paste them inside here. Text we want to draw is element in lines array. It holds individual lines as a string of text. If I make the text too long, it starts breaking to a new line and the starting top line moves upwards. Perfect. Here I just use the index and I multiply times line height to separate lines, like this. Down here we have event listener on the input field. I delete that. Up here I take text input variable and I turn it into class property inside effect class constructor. Directly inside the class constructor I also define event listener to apply it automatically at the point when I create an instance of effect class later in my code. We will listen for key up event. Callback function will clear canvas, deleting old paint. And then we call wrap text defined on line 36 and we pass it e.target.value, which is whatever was typed inside the text input field. We get an error on line 32. We are calling clear rectangle on something that is undefined. Why is this dot context undefined here? First of all, we need the variable for the event here. 
and when place an event listener inside a class constructor, we need to make sure we bind this keyword to make sure that the callback function on the event listener doesn't forget where it was originally defined. I can simply fix that by using an ES6 arrow function syntax. One of the special features of these functions is that they inherit this from the parent scope automatically, which will fix our problem. I also check if the key that was pressed is spacebar and only if it isn't we will call wrap text. This will be useful later, we don't want to animate particles for spaces between words. I also put clear rectangle inside, like this. We are drawing text on HTML canvas directly from an input field and that text is automatically wrapping and centering itself. And we wrote all of that as an object-oriented codebase with vanilla JavaScript. Well done! If you are a beginner, you should be really proud of yourself. We also now know how to use canvas gradients and how to outline and how to gain complete control over text drawn on HTML canvas element. Now it's time to turn this into animated interactive particles. This next part will be very advanced. If you are a beginner, I have a class dedicated to this technique where I use it on images. In there I go much slower at a beginner friendly pace. I will need some helper properties to create this particle effect. This dot particles will hold all particle objects. Gap will determine width and height of each individual pixel square and also at which resolution we will be scanning canvas for pixel data. Anything smaller than 3x3 three three pixels will probably give you performance issues because it will result in too many particles. I will show you when we have the full animation. I will store mouse data here. I will need a radius around the mouse. Particles within that radius area will move away from the mouse. I will set it to 20,000 pixels, but it will actually be much less. I need to use a large value here for optimization reason, because I won't be using performance expensive square root when calculating distance. I'll explain that later. Mouse X and Y will also be stored here. Same as we did on line 31 with text input field, I create an event listener for mouse move event. We know that I can't use a regular function here, it needs to be an arrow function to make sure this keyword is not undefined. Whenever mouse move event fires, I set mouse x from line 42 to x coordinate of the mouse event and I do the same for vertical y position. To check if it works, I console log this.mouse.x and this.mouse.y. I want the console log to run every time a mouse moves, so it has to be in here. Perfect, we are capturing mouse coordinates and we are saving them inside our class property. Here we have a custom method that takes a value from input field and it draws it on canvas and here inside converts to particles method we then turn that styled text into particles. I want this method to run every time we type into that input field and canvas text updates. Since that will reposition all the letters to keep them centered, I will always have to delete all particles, so I assign this to an empty array. Help a variable called pixels will call built-in getImageData method. This method will return auto-generated image data object which contains pixel data for a specified portion of canvas. I want to scan the entire canvas, so from 00, 0 to canvas with canvas height. Let's console log pixels to see what that image data looks like. To see it, we actually have to run the code inside convert to particles method. I will call it from inside wrap text after we drew text on canvas. So we can then call convert to particles automatically to scan that canvas element with the new updated text on it for pixel positions and colors. I can delete this console log on line 97 and since I'm calling wrap text on line 96, doing that also triggered convert to particles method for me. I can see the console log here. If I check my canvas context object first, get image data method we are using is coming from here. 
we drew text on canvas and then we used get image data to scan specified canvas area, in our case the entire canvas for pixel data. Get image data then returns this image data object for us and we are saving it as pixels variable. The most important thing in here is this data array. We can see it's a special type of array called UINT8 clamped array. It means this is a special type of array that can only contain unsigned 8-bit integers clamped to a range between 0 and 255. If you've seen RGB color declaration in CSS before, you know that each color in there is also defined by a value between 0 and 255. In this case even alpha opacity is also between 0, fully transparent, and 255, fully visible. This array has 1,152,800 elements. And the way data is organized here is that every four elements represent one pixel, specifically its red, green, blue and alpha values. We can see that canvas that was scanned is 550 times 524 pixels, which is 288,200. And if I multiply that times 4, we get 1,152,800. That checks out. This array has 1,152,800 elements. Each four elements represent one pixel. Our canvas has 288,200 pixels. We scanned the entire canvas. All this black background is actually transparent. The black color is behind it. That's why we have all these zeros. Zero red, zero green, zero blue and zero alpha. Zero opacity, it's a black transparent pixel. But if I look somewhere in the middle, I will start finding some values. For example, here we have a pixel that's 255 red, 255 green, 255 blue, which is white, and 255 alpha, fully visible. It must be one of the pixels that makes up the white text outlines. We can see the array being split into blocks in console, but it's actually just an extremely long array with a single sequence of indexes. We know that each four elements represent one pixel, so we know how to extract RGB colors. But since this array is just a single line of numbers, how do we know what is X and Y coordinate of each pixel? We can calculate that because we know the width of canvas, so we know after how many pixels we need to break to another line, how many pixels fit on each row. We have everything we need to create particles at the correct X and Y coordinates with the correct colors that will represent this text that was drawn on canvas. We just need to express that with JavaScript somehow. I assign pixels just to this long data array, so dot data. The following technique is very advanced. I have a class where I explain this for beginners on images. Today is just a crash course version. To cycle over a grid, we will use nested for loops. The outer for loop will handle rows, which will correspond to vertical Y coordinate of each particle as we go row by row from top to bottom through our pixel data. I will not just go in one pixel steps. That's why we have this dot gap property on line 39. I will go in three pixel steps in this case, plus equals this dot gap. I will basically slice canvas into a grid three times three pixels and for each grid cell I check if there is a color beneath. If there is, I create a particle object for that cell. Every time Y increases we enter a new row and we will cycle over horizontal positions on that row from left to right. So we are going over the entire canvas row by row from top to bottom, from left to right like this. These two nested for loops will cycle over the entire canvas element. So what do we do every time we jump to a new cell in this grid? First, we need to determine where we are in that pixel array, at which index. Pixel array is one long line of numbers and here we are cycling through canvas row by row. As we cycle through the grid cells, I always need to be aware what is the corresponding index in pixels array. I know that Y increases every time we cycled through a row of cells. Let's say we are somewhere in the middle now. The current index in the array is the current Y value times the width of canvas, which will give us something like this. 
This visual I'm showing you has big cells. Imagine it works like this, but on three times three pixel scale, so the actual cells are much smaller. So let's say y is currently two, two times canvas width to account for this area. Plus, we are somewhere in the middle of a new row. We also need to account for x. For example, x is three. And we know that each single pixel is represented by four elements in the array. Red, green, blue and alpha value, so I multiplied times 4. This single calculation will match x and y position in a grid with an index in that long array. This calculation is extremely complicated if this is the first time you are seeing it, so don't worry about it too much at this stage. We are JavaScript developers, not math experts. It will start making more sense if you decide to use this technique more often, but you don't really need to understand it today. I know alpha, opacity, is every fourth value in the array, so pixels array with the current index plus 3. Let's say we are on this index, red, green, blue, alpha, index plus 3. Whenever we jump to a new cell, as we cycle through canvas in a grid, we check what is the alpha in this area. If it's zero, we move on, we don't care about this area. It's transparent, so we know nothing is drawn there on canvas. If alpha is more than zero, we know there is something, so we know it has color. So we calculate red, this is simply pixels at this index. Green is index plus one, blue is the current index plus two. Now I can concatenate RGB string from that. Like this. We have X and Y position and color of that non-transparent cell. Perfect. I console look color. It gives me all these RGB values. It's working. Actually, this comma is not supposed to be here. Yes, these are the correct RGB color declarations. It's always good to use console.log to help us check things. Don't forget to delete them after. Especially when console logs are run from inside animation loop, they might considerably slow down your application. We converted pixel data into X, Y and color. We just need a particle class so that we can take this data and draw particles at these positions. Particle class will expect effect as an argument because I will need access to canvas width, canvas height and other properties sitting on that class from inside here. I convert it into a class property. This particle class will expect arguments for X, Y and color we calculated after scanning canvas for pixel data. X is coming from here, Y from here and color from here. We also convert these into class properties, like this. I actually want to be able to set where the particles first start and I want them to flow from there to their correct X and Y coordinates so I will have separate origin X and origin Y. These will actually remember particles position in the overall text shape and starting x will be a random value between zero and canvas width. This will make them animate from that random position to where they are supposed to be. I access canvas width property through this dot effect. It's coming from line 28 here. This dot y will be zero. This will look interesting as we type new letters. We will also experiment with different values here when we get the animation running. The size of each particle square will be the same as GAP, as the resolution at which we scanned canvas for pixel data. We defined GAP down here to be 3 pixels. We will need DX, the distance between mouse cursor and this particle horizontally, and DY, the distance between mouse and particle vertically. VX is horizontal speed, velocity X, VY is vertical speed, velocity Y. Force will be dynamically calculated from these values to push particle at a certain speed and angle will determine direction of that push. Distance between mouse and particle will sit in this class property. I could have also made these into let helper variables inside update method instead. It doesn't really matter. Putting distance here will allow us to use it in multiple places should we need it. 
Let's apply simple physics with friction, a random number between 0.15 and 0.75. And Ezin will be a random value between 0.005 and 1.005, like this. Using these same values will give us really cool particle motion. At the end you can come back here and try different values. Values you use here as friction and easing will have a major impact on how particles move and how they react to mouse and also how they assemble into text shapes. You will see it in a minute. Inside the draw method we set fill style to this dot color. Call in fill style in this draw method, which will be called 60 times per second for each particle object, is very performance expensive. Good optimization improvement here would be to first check if the color of this particle is different than the color of the previous one, and only if it is different we change fill style. I take context from line 38 again and I call fill rectangle method. I want to draw a rectangle representing the particle at the current x and y position and width and height will be this dot size from line 16. We defined our particle class, we will use it down here. As we are scanning canvas, if alpha of the cell we are scanning is more than zero, if there is something drawn on canvas, we calculate color of that particle from available pixel data and we take particles array from line 54. We push new particle object inside. I can see that it expects effect X, Y and color, so I pass it this representing the entire effect class from line 36 because we are inside of it. I pass it X from the inner for loop that cycles through the grid from left to right and Y will be from the outer for loop that cycles through canvas from top to bottom. Finally I pass it color, we calculate it on line 113. So we scan canvas for pixel data, we cycle through canvas in a grid. We convert position in a grid into index in pixel data array. We check if that pixel we are currently cycling over has opacity alpha more than zero. If it does, we create one new particle object for this piece of the image. Because text we write on canvas is basically just an image. What we just did is pretty complicated, I used it for so many different effects. It's a great creative coding technique to know, well done if you managed to follow all the way here, you're doing great. After the for loop I console log particles array to check if it worked. I can see array that contains 2010 particle objects created using our custom particle class. The number of these objects will depend on many things, mainly on how much canvas area is covered with text and the value of gap property on effect class. I check one of the particle objects, I want to make sure all the properties have values and nothing is undefined or none, not a number. It would indicate there is a problem somewhere, it looks alright in this case. It's a good practice to always check your objects when you create them in console to make sure everything is fine. Inside render method I call for each on the array and for each particle object I call update method from line 31 and draw method we defined up here on line 27. If I call render here we get this line of particles on canvas up here. It's because the first frame will be drawing the starting coordinates not where the particles will end up after they animate into position. If I want to see particles in their final positions I will have to use origin x and origin y inside fill rectangle method. Like this. Now the particles are sitting on top of the original text that was drawn here inside wrap text method and scanned and converted to particles here inside convert to particles method. I only want to draw that text so that I can analyze canvas for pixel data. I don't really want the sentences drawn by fill text and stroke text to stay on canvas after they have been drawn and scanned. So down here I call clear rectangle and I clear the entire canvas. Now we see only the particles, there is no text drawn on canvas anymore. Size of each particle depends on gap property on effect class. I can change that value here and look what happens. We just have a code base that can pixelate text based on any value we give it. But since each pixel is not just a simple drawing, it's a particle and each of these particles can move independently, we can do a lot of animation magic with this. I can make the size of each particle different 
than size of the gap, but still relative to gap. For example, maybe I want one pixel spaces in between. It can look interesting. Look how it changes as I increase gap property. I go up to line 16 and I put it back. I want particles to always want to return to their origin positions, so every animation frame this.x plus equals the difference between origin x position, where the particle is supposed to be sitting in the overall shape, and its current x position. Inside fill rectangle I will use this.x and this.y again. To see any animation I need to call draw and update on each particle over and over, so I need this render method from line 120 to be called from inside animation loop. To create a loop I use built-in request animation frame method and I pass it animate, the name of its parent function. We can delete all this, be careful not to delete the closing brackets. You will know you did something wrong if you get a console error. It looks like nothing is happening. I put console lock inside animation loop and I see we are actually animating. Perfect. Inside update method on particle class I also animate this.y by adding the difference between origin y and the current y position. The reason there is no animation is because we are animating it by the entire difference between positions in one animation frame. It just snaps back in place. If each step is just a fraction of that difference, so this whole thing times ease from line 25, we will actually see the movement of particles trying to get back to their original positions. Ok, this looks pretty cool on its own. I need to make some retro effect series and use this. <laughs> we see trails because we are not deleting old paint between each animation frame. Inside animation loop I call clear rectangle. I clear canvas, we update particle positions, we draw them and we repeat that over and over. We have animation. Awesome, we are finally getting the effect. I need to add some ease in to vertical Y position as well. The initial Y position starts at zero, so top, and initial X position is spread along the width of canvas. That's why my particles are coming from top like this. I love this effect, this is so cool. <laughs> but it can be so much better, let me show you. The initial vertical Y position can be anything we want. Let's try something. Maybe I want them to come from the bottom instead. Changing these values will make particles come from different places. Feel free to play with this and use your own ideas. For now I will go with this setup and I will move on. When I type into the input field the text is assembling itself. Maybe I could give it some kind of delay, there are many things I can do here. Larger font size, While all of this is happening, and as you can see there is a lot happening in this codebase already, I also want particles to react to mouse position, and I want particles to move away from it, and kinda circle around mouse as we move it around. This dot x, distance on the horizontal x axis, is the difference between the current mouse position from line 60 and the current particle position. DY, vertical distance, is the difference between mouse Y and particle Y. To calculate distance between these two points we can use Pythagoras theorem. Math square root from DX times DX plus DY times DY. This simple formula will allow us to calculate the distance between any two points, in this case between this particle and mouse cursor. We check DX the distance between mouse and particle horizontally, we check dy, the distance between mouse and particle vertically. We have two sides of imaginary right triangle and Pythagoras theorem will help us to calculate the longest side of this triangle, opposite the right angle, so called hypotenuse. In this case hypotenuse is the actual distance between mouse and particle. 
This is probably the most useful formula in creative coding. I use it all the time for everything. <laughs> JavaScript also has a built-in method, math.hypotenuse, that expects dy and dx as arguments, and it will calculate the distance for us. Because math square root is a very expensive operation, I can just not use it at all. The formula will still work. I just need to use much larger values inside mouse radius on line 61, since I'm not square rooting the distance value. Now I will calculate force that will push on particles when they are within mouse radius area. It will be equal to the ratio between mouse radius and the distance between this particle and mouse position. To push particles away from mouse correctly, I have to use minus here. I know it because I use this a lot. When we have the animation working, we can put plus here. It might make it more clear what exactly is happening. I check if distance between this particular particle we are running this update method on and mouse cursor is less than mouse radius, meaning that particle is close enough to mouse cursor, we need to calculate the direction in which we want to push. I need to calculate an angle between positive x-axis and a line projected from position 0, 0 towards particle position, which is exactly what math.atan2 JavaScript method does. So again, math.atan2 gives us an angle in radians between positive x-axis and a line projected from point 0, 0 towards particle position. It gives us this angle. Math.atan2 expects dy first and dx as the second argument, which is a bit unusual, so keep that in mind when using it. Now that we know the angle, we can define vx, horizontal speed, by saying plus equals force we calculated on line 35 times angle from line 38, passed to math.cosine. We do the same thing for vy, but we pass it to math.sine. Math.cosine and math.sine combined work together to map particle movement along a circular radius. This will look really good. For this to work, I actually need to include vx and vy in position calculations here. I use this.vx here. And I do times equals friction from line 24. This will gradually slow down particle speed for us. Let's see what we have. Nice, this is really cool. I do the same for vertical Y position. I notice I misspelled this.vy here on line 20. Easy fix. Now I can multiply this by friction as well to make particles return to their original positions. What do you think about this effect? You can change how the particles behave around the mouse by changing values we use as friction on line 24 and ease on line 25. If you have any performance issues at this point, increasing this dot gap to a larger value will massively reduce the number of calculations needed to run this effect. Maybe try to find the right balance between particle size and performance. Also it depends how long the text is. If it's just one letter, it will run much faster than if it's five words. There are many optimization algorithms I can use here to make it run smoothly with any particle size, but that's beyond the scope of this class. I'm trying to keep this beginner friendly. We can try different color gradients if you want to. We can also try a different font. We can try experimental letter spacing property again. It still works as you can see. You can edit the text we draw on canvas in any way you want. This codebase is very flexible. Different fonts, especially custom ones, can have different baseline and height. Maybe we want the ability to manually adjust vertical text position. I create property called vertical offset and I set it to minus 160 pixels. I will include that value here in text y position calculation. Now I can move text freely up and down by any pixel value to manually adjust it. This gives us even more granular control over the text we are drawing if needed.
I'm passing hard-coded text that says hello how are you here. We hold an instance of effect class here, so this object and I draw the value from this text input field from line 58. I access it by taking the instance of effect class, then its text input property from line 58 and I access its value, which is by default set to type something here. I change the default value to let's learn JavaScript. Hmm, interesting. I set font size to 90, 110 pixels, vertical offset 0, I want to clear the console. I delete this console log from line 131, also this one from line 6. As I type into the field, the text updates. Perfect. In console I'm getting a message that says multiple readback operations using getImageData are faster with willReadFrequently attribute set to true. We are using get image data to read pixel data from Canvas Element, which can be a performance-intensive operation. One of the more recent Canvas features is the option to mark Canvas for reading, which will automatically optimize the Canvas for us under the hood, and in theory it should improve performance. So where do we put this will read frequently attribute? Some of you might not know that getContext method we are using on line 3 to initialize Canvas rendering context can also accept optional second argument called context attributes. So here I'm passing it context type, in this case 2D, and context attributes will come in brackets like this. We can include multiple attributes here if we want to. Some of them help with performance optimization. Today we will just use will read frequently and we set it to true. This will force the use of a software accelerated to the canvas instead of hardware accelerated and it can save memory when we call get image data frequently when we are reading and analyzing pixels from this canvas frequently as i type the particle text updates and we get no console warning anymore it worked We can also use different web fonts, it's easy. I can, for example, go to Google Fonts website and I search for a font called Bangers. I click here to add it to my selected font families and then I view it up here. I copy these three link tags and I put them inside the document header before my custom style sheet. In Script.js on line 91, I set Canvas font property to this new font, like this. This should already work in most cases. Sometimes we can get default font on the first page load and only get this special font as we start typing. I'm not going to explain how to preload web fonts in this class, but what can help is applying that font with CSS to force it to load. I take the CSS rule here and in the case of this project, I can apply the font family to everything, to all elements on my page, which should also affect the text we see inside the input element. Yes, so this is a simple and easy way to use custom web fonts in your Canvas project. Are you having fun? <laughs>As with every Canvas project, Canvas doesn't automatically resize when we change browser window size. I need to reload the entire page to size it correctly. If I want my effect to be responsive, we need to write some additional logic. With JavaScript, we can listen for window resize event. It will trigger every time the browser window changes size. When the resize event fires, first I want to set Canvas width from line 6 and Canvas height from line 7 to the new width and height of the browser window, like this. We also have properties that keep track of width and height here inside the effect class. We need to set them to the new updated values. I create a public method on my effect class. I will call it resize. It will expect the new width and height as arguments. Then we can update properties from line 52 and 53 with these new updated values, like this. 
Then we also need to update text X and text Y properties to make sure they are in the middle of the new resized area. I just put them here like this. One more property that depends on width is this one. Max text width will also have to be recalculated every time the resize event is triggered. So we have a custom class method that will take new width and height as arguments and it will set properties of our object to these new values. I want this method to run every time resize event fires and I pass it the new resized canvas width as width and the new resized height as height, like this. It doesn't work yet, so I check if resize event is triggering by putting console log in there. Yes, the console log is working. Every time I resize, I also have to call wrap text to reposition that text we write on canvas, which will also automatically call convert to particles. So I call effect.wrap text and I pass it the current value of text input field. It's working and we can see that the text correctly recalculated its position and all the words are on a single line. If I make the window smaller, it will put the word JavaScript on the second line. If I make my browser window even smaller, it will break into three lines. This is working really well, nice. If you want better performance, increase the value of gap. This will make individual particles larger, so we get less particles overall. That means less calculations are needed to create and run this effect. You can change font style, change colors. You can make it write your name and screenshot the canvas by right clicking it. Then select save image as. This will export the current canvas drawing, current animation frame as a PNG image. In the extended version, we will take this a few steps further. I will show you how to turn this code base into the famous particle constellations effect. I will include the full source code and because as usual I made hundreds of different versions of this effect, I will probably include some other additional code bases with my experiments for you to play with. Like this one or this one. Well done if you managed to follow all the way here. You are becoming very good with JavaScript. As we all know, with great power comes great responsibility. Use your coding superpowers responsibly. <laughs> the extended version is linked in the video description. I'll see you later.